As someone who, you know, was rolling around with certified wires yep, yep. and was a member of Fun Cause and, you know, was was right there in that early 2000 period, um, you would have seen the hoods sort of develop or yeah, you've seen quite a chunk of the hoods development because as from, you said... I remember putting on shows down at Rumpus Room, um, which was Flagstaff Hill. Wow. The Flaggy at the back room there. Flaggy Hill Hotel. Yeah, man. I remember paying the Hoods 500 bucks to, to headline one of the nights there. And that was a lot back then. Mm. Um, and, you know, there being about 150 cats in the back room there on a Thursday night or something in Adelaide. So that'd, be, that'd be like a 99, yeah, something 2000. Like that, 2000, 99 or something. I can't remember. Yeah, it was pretty early on. Yeah, yeah I got I got flies at home from that stuff. So yeah, social change played and um, crossbred and hilltop and that. Yeah, we we used to do it every every month, I think. And what were the crowds like? Pretty good. I remember Charles. That was the first time I uh, met Charles. Well, I snuck him in. He was underage, and Kirk kind of rolled up and said, "Oh, this cat wants to get in." I'm, and like Charles came up to me. I'm like, <laughs> I was on the door. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> fucking scary. He was like, fucking sick cut, man, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, that was it. If he was underage, yeah, it would have been 99, not 2000 or something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, wow. Like, and then so that would have been because the first Hoods release was 97. 98, not 98. 97, 98. I think it was a matter of time, yeah. And so that's after that, but before the second one. Yeah, 2001 was left foot, right foot. So back once again, though. Yeah, back once again was 98 or whatever. Oh, matter of time. Was Sorry, the second I, one. Yeah, back once again was earlier, wasn't it? 97, 96. Yeah. yeah. So that rumpus room stuff. Matter of time been, was 98. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it would have been 90, it would have been 2000, I reckon. Okay. Now, the landscape obviously back then was so different, <laughs> totally different. to what it is yeah. now. I mean, now there is a full on landscape. Back then, to my understanding, there wasn't really even. You know, there was a scene, but mm. the only people that knew about it were the people doing it. Mm. So when the Hoods were doing these earlier shows, mm. you know, what sort of numbers were, were, were being 150 pulled? 150 or so people that was what we would pull, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not completely privy to all exactly all their numbers and stuff like that. Um, you know, it started to grow pretty quickly, though. You know, the Hoods always had, you know, they were always the number one crew, you know, simple as that. So mm. they always had the bigger following out of anyone. They had a bit more vibe buzz and they were better at it than anyone else pretty much. And did you, like, could you pick it from an early stage? Like this is something special and... I kind of felt it, yeah. I really did. I, I believed in what we were doing. I really did. Um, even if other people didn't, I believed in what we were doing. Um, yeah, and as soon as it started to catch, I knew it was going to go. Mm. You know, in that 2003, 2004 period, you know, when, when um, the Hoods obviously started to get a red radio play and other crews were starting to get on the scene as well, you know, Downside were doing good things, stuff like that. And there was a, a family as such kind of growing around the, the nation. Um, I knew something was going to come out of it, yeah. Mm. In those early stages, was there a lot of like, oh, you know, what are you guys doing? This is American you know, a lot of like... Yeah, from the general, general public, I guess, yes and no. You either got unnoticed or you didn't get a lot of hay as such. There was. There was a lot of misunderstanding, you know what I mean? Like even from people like, my, you know, my parents and stuff, you know, mm. they'd be like, what the hell are you doing? You know, what's this DJing that you're doing? You know what I mean? And then, you know, suddenly you're playing Big Day Out and they get it, you know what I mean? They go, oh, okay, you know. And they understand suddenly that it's, it's, it's more than that and there is a following and there is, you know, a culture behind it as such. And stuff, mm. you know. But, yeah, I mean, like, it was, it was always a massive uphill battle to get recognition and, and, and also um, respect um, on many fronts. I know with the Hoods, when I was starting to tour around with those guys and being their tech help, stagehand slash DJ slash whatever you name it, they got so much bullshit and heat from and hate from the rock bands and the rock roadies and things like that and the whole festival crews and crowd um, 
industry wise when they started hitting main stages you know and they were starting to get real big and you know they were uh, playing with jet or something like that you know what i mean mm. and um the road is not all like, they just treat us like shit you know what i mean like they would be like oh here comes the you know the bullshit act the token act you know what i mean and they'd you know clean the floor <laughs> wipe the floor with them in terms of crowd response you know what i mean and it'd be like you know that's what we're all about and that type of thing but it was years and years and years of you know getting treated at the second rate for mm. sure so late 90s you know you've booked them for a couple gigs <laughs> yeah 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 there. yeah just running a little small thing down down there and then i think oh one was when left foot right foot dropped yep and so i remember that record because that was where soul of the beat was yep. off yep and that was where i first heard people like because i was in flagstaff hill yeah which is right down the road Road, yep um you know people going oh you know hilltop hoods have you heard of hilltop hoods they're from blackwood and then that's how it sort of came onto my radar yep now did you see like quite a, a a bit of popularity brewing at that stage yeah there the was a little bit yeah foot. yeah there was a little bit there i mean like gigs were still getting quite reasonable turnouts like the culture king stuff um that got decent turnouts and then you know the international touring acts that would be coming through you know uh, trent uh rodent was still slingshot out. yeah slingshot yeah, he was he was trent. bringing out dudes um back then and then obviously that's where you know and, and pj was doing good gigs um, and Dimes, he was getting busy, you know, he was doing gigs and stuff with PJ and, and Kirk. And, um, you know, Mad Cat was doing gigs and stuff like that. He'd be doing most of Trent's shows uh, and dudes that he would be bringing out. Um, you know what I mean? So there was like early shows like, um, uh, it was like AC Alone at Proscenium mm. and things like that. They were really good, you know, well turned out gigs. And then all the Vocal Lords gigs, you know, when Latyrix came and, and things like that, you know, they were really wow. good gigs, man, you know. And that, that were really healthy turnouts. Like, that was the Royal uh, Pack, so it was like 800 people or something. That was like the golden era for us. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that was really good gigs, man, yeah. And so then the record after that was The Calling. Yeah. Which I think was 03-ish. Like of 03, 03 I think. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And that's the one that had nosebleed section. Yeah. And that, you took, know. Took off. Yeah, it took it yeah. to another level. Now, I remember being at the launch at Planet. Yep, at and Planet, And it was yep. like, wow. And I distinctly remember, um, what's the last joint on that album? The Sentinel. And that was, you know, I just remember that. Just like, man, this is popping. Like, people were just going nuts and shit. Mm. Now, as someone who was right there when all that was happening... Tell us what you saw, like, in terms of, you know, when the hood's kind of that popping sort of phase. They, like. were, they were learning as they were going as well, you know what I mean? Like, they they were just professional about their their, their thing. But, like, to see the, the vibe of those gigs was awe-inspiring. It really was. And you, we got a high off of it. And you mm. only wanted to do another one and do it better and do it bigger. And what can we do next? can we do next uh, what's bigger what's bigger what's bigger and the kings of that shit were always the hoods because they always had the biggest following the biggest crew and the biggest foresight into seeing where what and their, their planning and their business was above everyone else and things like that um you know what i mean and it, it still to this day not many sa crews have even got to the stage of where they've got you know what i mean like in terms of playing Thebe theater or mm. you know what i mean like which is to me, what I class the ultimate achievement in in Adelaide, you know what I mean? When always played Thebe and stuff like that, it was like, yes, you know, we've fucking made it, you know, because this is like such a prestigious stage. You don't play Thebe to make money. You you play Thebe to, you know, it's the best stage and it's just a sick crowd and, you know, mm. that, it's what we wanted to do, you know what I mean? Like that's a stamp of, yeah, you did it for perception and reputation, you know, bang. Yeah, I remember when, when the Oars sold out Thebe, I was there. I think I might have warmed up, and that was actually yep. the first time I met um, Hi-Fi, Blake. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Backstage and shit, and I started doing gigs for him after that. That was a crazy gig, man. Yep. That was some epic shit. And I think at Thebe, after the Hood's Calling launch. Yeah, see, that was massive. When they did Thebe, it was like, holy shit has arrived. You know, everything's arrived, <laughs> you know. That was the show that woke me up. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now tell us about that because from my memory, I just remember it was after hours. Then it was fun cause. Yeah, something like that. Yep. Yep. And then stain. Yep. Came on. That was the first time I seen stain, and like that changed a lot for me, man. He came out with I remember like the L.A. hat, <laughs> Brimo. Yeah, and he had eyes. he used to have killer sets back then. Remember his set was nuts, oh, man. man. He was just slamming through like records like Mixmaster Mike and shit. He was it, going through his records and yeah. That, it. Yeah, that that really had an influence, just that set alone. That was kind of like that and, you know, the one I saw you play, yep. Green Lantern, you know, yep, some yep, memorable yep, yep. ones that I was like, oh, wow, I've got to change the way I do my shit. Yeah. Now, that particular gig, I mean, what do you remember from that from that night? From which one? The the one at Thebby, which was 04, just after the calling out. That was – um, yeah, that was it was it, that was an interesting one. It was the first of the feelings of those big home shows. And those big home shows by now, you know, there's been quite a few of them now, you know, that I was involved with and there's you know, obviously more so. But that was the first big one. Obviously they had massive screens up on stage, you know what I mean? Like the set was not just them playing a record, it was also a visual feast. Mm. You know what I mean? And it was sick sounds, sick visuals, incredible set. That type of thing. And then when we get to support something like that and you're playing in front of 2,000 people, it was one of those A, nerve-wracking things where we got to step up and, you know, real appreciative of uh, the the opportunity to do something like that as well, to play in front of those kind of crowds. And you know they're going to be eating out of your hand, those type of things. And it's like, yeah, we're going to have fun with this. Yeah. But also that feeling of pride, you know what I mean? And this is the feeling that I, this is what I was trying to portray as well, like, you know, it wasn't just me being reflux and playing out and getting my own feedback. It's like the oars played and we rocked it and then the hoods played and I'd be sitting beside a stage of the hoods and be like, yeah, man, I'm proud. You know what I mean? Like this mm. is this is us. You know what I mean? Like playing to this and and killing it. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, you know, you just got a vibe off of that. Everyone did. Mm. And then I guess after that, that's when you would have been doing – Quite a bit of traveling with the hoods. Yeah, yeah. At that 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 stage, I think it was like oh, oh six. When they had my when they bought Maestro out, and they did that stopping all stations tour. So it was a hard yeah. road, you know what I mean. So stopping all stations tour, I did that. It was like thirty something shows around the country, and that was like the first big tour. And it was like fifteen hundred people a night, you know, to two thousand people a night, type of thing, and bigger in the in the capitals. And Maestro came out, and Maestro's a lord. He's, he's so much fun, man. So I was DJing for him and as well as DJing, you know, like the lead-up kind of sets. And I was also, you know, kind of tech-supporting them as well and stuff. And um, that was mental. That was good fun, you know what I mean? That's when I first got a vibe of I got to touch all base around Australia. I understood touring. I understood what it takes, what it's all about. Mm. And then from there on, I was doing all the festivals with the hoods, and, and then Oz started doing the obviously the hangover stuff at 08, 09, 010. Then Oz got on the festival route, and we were doing heaps of festivals. So it was like that period of 06 to 0, 06 to 12 or so was just like mental, real busy. The, the, the last